there's always a story behind my presentations for you know how they come about and what happened with this presentation was I was actually in the process of performing an espionage simulation with you know while I was working for another company and it was an espionage simulation against kind of like a global 10 type of company and they wanted a full-scale simulation and all that stuff so what happened is I was always using like a technical penetration testing team as well as what I call a human penetration testing team and I kind of again I call them espionage simulations I don't like calling them pen tests I don't like calling it social engineering because I kind of think social engineering is for amateurs and stuff like that so anyway as part of this test I had my friends Stan and Stu who are going to help me with the espionage simulation and Stan is basically a former colonel in the Russian GRU and Stu is a former Navy SEAL whose specialty was infiltrating enemy harbors, planting explosives on the side of ships before they leave port and blowing them up if they ever decide to leave port. So anyway, that's the type of people there. But I had one guy on the technical team who really, really thought he was like good at social engineering and wanted to do social engineering. He's like, I want to do social engineering. I go, you're not doing the social engineering. I go, the fact you're calling it social engineering bothers the hell out of me to begin with. So anyway, he's like, well, I want to do social. I go, you're not doing it. So every time this thing would come up, he'd always say, I want to do the social engineering. I'm like, you're not doing the social engineering. So any, when we were like getting like to about the week before the test was going to be run, you know, all of a sudden I got a call from people. This is when I worked for a large company and they said, Ira, you know, the boss's boss's boss wants to have a meeting and, you know, we want you to be on it. I go, why? And it's like, well, so-and-so wanted the meeting. I'm like, he doesn't want a meeting. He just wants to do what he calls the social engineering piece. And he's not going to do it. It's like, well, it's already on the schedule, so, you know, we have to have the meeting. So anyway, we're sitting there going through the meeting and it's like, you know, and, and like this guy was doing all the talk. He's like, well, we have to go over logistical concerns. I'm like, what logistical concerns? He's like, so what rental car companies are we going to use? How many rental cars should we have? Are there preferred hotels? What is the per diem rate? And all this sort of crap that nobody, I'm like, will you just, I'm thinking, will you just get to it? And so we go on and on and talk about ridiculous stuff for 15 minutes. And then he's like, oh, I think I'm done. Oh, wait a second. I forgot. Um, who's going to be doing the social engineering piece? I go, it's going to be myself leading it. And it's going to be Stan and Stu. And then he's like trying to sound intelligent. And you know how like somebody tries to sound intelligent and they're forcing the issue? He's like, hmm, very interesting. Why do we have to bring in outside contractors to do the work when we have perfectly capable people internally to do the work? And he thought me, you know, he thought it was like such a brilliant argument. I go, we don't have perfectly capable people to do the work. And he's like, I go, and they're like, well, why do we, I go, look. You know, Stan is basically a person who got people to betray their country under penalty of death, and Stu's a former Navy SEAL. And, I, and then he's like, he, and then all of a sudden, you know, he lost his cool because he was trying to act cool for too long. And he goes, look, I, we don't have to bring in outsiders. I know how to check doors to see if they're locked. I know how to check monitors to see if there's sticky papers on it. We don't need to bring in outsiders. And I'm sitting there, he was hoping to dumbfound me, which he did. Because all of a sudden, here's probably one of the 10 best technical penetration testers in the world. And it just, it struck me as to how clueless he was with regard to what he was calling social engineering. Because, I mean, he's thinking social engineering is checking doors to see if they're locked and checking monitors to see if they're sticky papers. I mean, you know, again, Stan get peop gets people to betray their country under penalty of death while Stu infiltrates enemy harbors. There's a different level of experti expertise than teaching pe you know, checking doors to see if they're locked. So again, I was like totally dumbfounded by it. But again, just to give you an idea of what happened, during the penetration test, I snuck my team in physically and you know, they were gonna go back and do the technical work later. But you know, I snuck my team in, we got, walked, got by the guards, went ahead, and as we're looking around, Stan goes to me and it's like, um, Ira, what are all these Chinese American dictionaries doing on the shelves here? I'm like, have you seen US colleges lately, Stan? I said to him sarcastically, he's like, I'll, I'll look into that. So anyway, I pretty much, we were done. Physically, we infiltrated their main computer operations center, planted back doors on their, net, on their systems, which were all left logged on in the operations center, and, Stan, you know, and I, we were done. So Stu and I pretty much left after the first day. Stan calls me up two days later, and out of nowhere, he goes, Ira, there are black duck eggs on the menu. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And Stan goes, it's like, 
Ira, don't you know black duck eggs are delicacy in China? I go, that information has escaped me. And he goes, don't you know I can't get black duck eggs in San Francisco, let alone this little piece of crap town in the middle of nowhere? Now, I'm, of course, paraphrasing how a Russian military officer would talk, but, you know, for the most part, and then it started to strike me. It's like what Stan did was, when he saw the Chinese-American dictionaries on the shelf, he decided to go to Chinese social clubs and Chinese restaurants in the area, realizing that how China works is they work by infiltrating companies, or not by infiltrating companies, but by setting up social situations where they can interact with employees and see who might be tempted by some of the delicacies. So, for example, somebody might come in, see the black duck eggs, and say, oh, you like these. You know, are you here on a visa? Are you here permanently? Do you have family back? in China? Would you like them to be healthy or whatever else? And, you know, essentially that's their way of, you know, infiltrating large companies. So Stan find, found a Chinese intelligence operation operating out of a Chinese restaurant across the street from their main research and development center. Now here's the thing. Somebody who's checking doors to see if they're locked and checking monitors for sticky papers is going to totally miss a Chinese intelligence operation. I mean, it kind of screwed everything up for us because all of a sudden, you know, then we had to stop and, you know, get the FBI involved, but that's a different story. But, you know, the whole concept was, was that here's a guy who's one of the best technical hackers I've ever met, and he has no clue what social engineering is really supposed to be. And that's where I came up with the topic of like this because it's like a lot of people don't know what they don't know about a whole bunch of topics in computer security. And here's the thing. I, this audience, you know, I originally put this presentation together for a more general audience and Konamicon said, it's like, well, part of the problem we have is that the average, comp is that the average person doing fuzzing has a hard time trying to rationalize what they're doing to the non-technical staff who doesn't have an appreciation for what fuzzing is and how to do it. So the purpose of the presentation, again, going on the theme of people not knowing what they don't know, is how to go ahead and basically relate fuzzing to the average person so that you can get more budget and hopefully buy more Konamicon stuff in the end of the day. But again, it helps to justify your existence, if nothing else. So anyway, you know, fuzzing's powerful. It's about testing. And here's the part, because when we talk to like the, the non Real, you know, the people who aren't of your skill level, the general conversation we come back with is like, oh, we're running vulnerability testers. We don't need fuzzers. And I'm like, that's not the point. You don't get what fuzzing really is. Again, they think, you know, vulnerability scanners look for known vulnerabilities while fuzzing is something that looks for unknown vulnerabilities that you don't know. So it's important to make that distinction. Let me talk about art versus science, and this is actually a DEF CON story. Because most of you are probably here, and you know, like, you don't come to Black Hat or DEF CON to actually go to Black Hat or DEF CON. You go to catch up with your friends, you go to catch up and meet new people and stuff like that. So a few years ago, I was attending, a, you know, I was attending DEF CON, and I asked all my friends, I'm like, who haven't I spoken to that I might be able to learn something from? And they pointed me to this one guy, and they're like, we think he may be good but we're not really sure. So I walk over the guy, and I go, well, you know, my friend so-and-so says you're really good, and I just kind of want to get a feel for how you, you know, you approach computer hacking. And he looks at me, he goes, hum, you seem humble enough, my little Padawan, which really set me off. It kind of just pissed me off. So anyway, and then I was like, well, okay, so how do you hack a computer? How do you, he's like, well, I look at a computer, and I get a feel for it. I'm like, you look at a computer and get a feel. I go, could I paraphrase for a second? He's like, you can attempt to. I go, so basically what you do is you perform an initial scan of the system, and based on the initial scan of the system, you know the hardware on the system and the software on the system, and based on the hardware and software suite, you know the vulnerabilities that likely exist in that hardware and software suite. He's like, oh, no, no, it's much more than that. I go, really? Once you know the likely vulnerabilities on the hardware software suite, then you can go ahead and start, you know, searching the internet for a bunch of manual techniques or automated tools that exploit that set of hardware and software. He's like, no, it's more than that. And I go, once you have those tools run, you go ahead, you run the tools, you, put a, you establish the hole in the system, you put a back door in, you start putting sniffers on the network. He's like, you just don't understand. You go storming out of the room. Why? He's not special anymore. All of a sudden, he looked like he has a feel for things. He thought he was an artist. People get mad at me. I don't think that there's anybody who's good at their job who's a quote-unquote artist. Because an artist gives you the impression they, approach, they do something one day, one way, and then they do something the next day another way. 
And you don't want that. You want somebody who has a repeatable process that does it again and again and again. Yes, some people have better skills. Some people do have a better background information on how to go ahead and approach hacking. They can methodically go down and do things. How many people heard of the psychological concept of visualization? Okay, few people, not the audience for visualization. But anyway, visualization is the ability to sequentially manipulate objects in your mind. So, for example, one of the tests for it is the paper folding test. If you've ever seen that test that you had to take at some point in your life where like it shows you you have four squares, one on top of the other, and two squares on the side, and you fold it together, you know, what, what would you get? You get a cube. That's a test of visualization, you know, to sequentially manipulate objects in your mind. And it's been shown that people who have better visualization tend to have better computer aptitude. So, yes, having a skill, having better aptitude and combining it makes somebody a better scientist. So, for example, you know, you, you look at Leonardo da Vinci, who's like w considered one of the world's greatest artists in history. But what did Leonardo da Vinci do? How did he go ahead and know how to paint the body so well? He would go ahead and dissect bodies. You know, he dissected more bodies than doctors would dissect in their medical school training to figure out how the musculature is and all that sort of stuff. Again, he was a scientist and he was able to produce great art because of his scientific background. But we just happen to call it art and call him an artist. But again, having a better abilities and more passion does kind of make you better at it but you don't need to be the best at it. As long as you have a repeatable process and can be trained in that repeatable process, you can go ahead and essentially know how to break software. This is where fuzzing comes in, especially fuzzing tools. That again, you can run the tools again and again and again, and it provides you a repeatable process because you know that's one of the goals of a good fuzzer, to be able to recreate the tools so you can find the vulnerability or find the initial bug and then figure out how, whether or not the initial bug is is actually a vulnerability later on. Here's another type of principle and I'll go into and why this is important later. You know, I, again, I have what people describe as adult attention deficit disorder. I'll just accept that as a, you know, I'll just accept that. You know, I have a black belt in karate. I have, and, and everybody's like, oh, do you know the secrets of the ninja? They'll go to me sarcastically. I go, here's the secrets of the ninja. There are no secrets of the ninja. You know, think of it this way. What's martial arts? It's punching, kicking, and blocking. There isn't anything else to it. It's punching, kicking, and blocking. But, you know, you think about what's the difference between a white belt and a black belt. The difference between a white belt and a black belt or a martial arts master is they have just mastered what? The basics. There's only so many ways to punch, so many ways to block, and so many ways to kick. That's all it is. But once you've perfected it, like how do you turn your body slightly to put more power behind a punch? Or how do you block a punch from somebody that tall compared to somebody that tall, you know, or whatever else? And those are the finer points you get by practicing again and again and mastering the basics so you can apply it in a way that looks masterful. Now, why is this related to computer hacking? Because, you know, people get aggravated by me because I say fundamentally, there's only really two ways to hack a computer. I mean, no matter what they think, they're like, well, what about compar Unix compared to, like, iOS or something like that? Well, actually, it's kind of the same thing. But, you know, anyway, like Windows compared to iOS or something. I'm like, it's irrelevant because fundamentally there's only, you know, I look at it from a semantic per perspective, not syntactical. Semantic perspective to me is like there's two ways to hack a computer. First, take advantage in the way a user or administrator configures or maintains the software or uses the software. So for example, you know, and this is oversimplifying it for this audience, but you know, I joke around when I worked at the National Security Agency that I had a friend, uh, one of the women I was, uh, like I was tr supposed to train this woman who came into the office and her last name was Kirk, K-I-R-K, like Captain Kirk. And I'm training her how to use the system. I like log on to the system, great. Now you have to log on to the database, enter your database ID, which is gonna be your last name, Kirk, K-I-R-K. Now enter your password, Captain, C-A-P-T-A-I-N. And she turns around looking at me in horror going, how do you know what my password is? I'm like, you've got to be kidding. And then she like goes to me. It's like, no, captain's really my password. And then she stops her. And then she goes, and by the way, my father was in the army. At one point, he was a captain. So there really was a Captain Kirk. I'm like, whatever. 
But anyway, that's a way of taking an otherwise secure computer system and rendering it insecure because of how they configured the password. You know, likewise, how do you enable client server computing? Do you isolate it so that you only allow specific people to connect at specific times on, from specific network domains, which you can, or do you just go ahead and share the hard drive to the world, letting anybody connect to it? That's a configuration issue. The other way is um, taking advantage of vulnerabilities built into the software. Now, here's the concept. I tell Codenomicon that their focus on security is wrong. You know, because really, co software fuzzing is not just about you know, security, it's about reliability in general, because all software has bugs. That's a given. That's it, you know, every software I've written is going to have a bug. However, some bugs create elevated privileges or cause information leakage, and that's generally what we consider a security vulnerability. Now, that's the other way to hack a computer, by taking advantage in the bugs that are inherent in the software that you're trying to exploit. Now, the thing about that is there's really nothing you can do if you're using that software to necessarily prevent that, unless, of course, you turn off the services, the software, or whatever else. However, coming back to this whole concept, this is where you can start explaining the bugs you're finding to other people. Because what happens is you say, look, all software has bugs, some of these bugs are security vulnerabilities, and this is what we're trying to address with something like fuzzing. Because fuzzing specifically is trying to find the bugs before other people find it. Because, you know, how do people find bugs? You know, they go out, they search it, they run, you know, debuggers against it, they run other fuzzers against it or whatever else, or they just use it and in the process of using it, eventually, you know, I guess the internet is like the proverbial, you know, if you give a million monkeys a million hours, they'll end up finding, you know, they'll end up writing like a work of art on a typewriter. The reality is you give a million internet users a million hours on the internet and they'll be able to pretty much find just about every bug known to mankind. The thing is, good fuzzers find the bugs before other people get, can get to them. And that's why you want to do this, because that is fundamentally how to hack a computer. Um, let's see, cover that. Take advantage of configuration problems, cover that. Take advantage of software. Um, anyway, okay, so let's talk about the typical vulnerability life cycle. Basically, the developer writes software with a vulnerability in it, and the software begins to get used, and that's all well and good. And the vulnerability is found by accident or on purpose, like everybody knows. And then the developer hopefully finds out about it. Like So, for example, if you do responsible disclosure, the, the person who finds the vulnerability gives it, to the per, you know, gives it to the developer and says, here's the vulnerability. Maybe you want to take care of this before the world finds out about it. Maybe I'll tell them. Maybe I won't. But anyway, and then the developer fixes it, and then they implement the patch. That's the ideal situation. The reality of the situation is that rarely ever happens. You know, as, as you're well aware, the problems occur, the vendors are alert, are, you know, vendors sometimes aren't alerted about the problem before the fix can be out. That's what you all know is a zero day vulnerability where there's no proactive fix in place. The more common problem though is what we're finding is that generally users don't bother fixing the problems. The software is in production and the users don't happen to go ahead and look for software updates and all that sort of stuff. And now if you're a software developer, frankly, they're going to point the finger at you even though you've done everything humanly possible to get rid of the vulnerability in advance for them. But they're going to go there, let the software work. I mean, the, true story. I was actually, I was doing a, a security assessment on a company and we were running a ping scan just to catalog their network before we go in and actually try to hack it. And the ping scan kept crashing their high availability servers. You know, by default, that's kind of bad. You know, what are we doing? We're pinging them. We're not even attacking them. And then all of a sudden, we get complaints in the middle of the night. Your security assessment is crashing our, you know, our systems. I'm like, we're not doing a security assessment. We're doing a ping scan. They're like, that's an assessment. I'm like, wait a second. Then it turns out they had these HP high availability servers and there was a known vulnerability three years before that they didn't upgrade for. And all of a sudden, it's like, luckily, the security manager we were working with finally, you know, he's like, look, if you haven't upgraded your system in three years, we're not going to hold them because no responsible person on the, no responsible admin or even security professional could ever assume that our systems are three years out of date. But that is the situation. But of course, we look bad for doing it, and then HP looks bad for having this bad software that crashes. 
But really, what's the problem? The problem is that the users aren't updating their system. And that's probably the most common thing. You know, also another issue, and then sometimes it happens where you can't update the software. Sometimes there are dependencies like you know, one of the more, I guess one of the more obvious ones that I can recall was there was like something with Windows NT Service Pack 4 where you weren't allowed to upgrade, where if you upgraded Windows Service Pack 4, it would cause the Oracle program to break because there was a dependency in Oracle that would crash Windows, that would crash the Windows system. So you couldn't upgrade there. So now what's the lesson from there? Problems occur. And ideally, the way to explain this to your users, your management, is that all these things will occur and you've got to proactively know they'll occur and try to get rid of the bugs before they exist. Because if we can get rid of the bugs before they exist, we decrease the cost by a thousand times of what it would be and sometimes we can't even get rid of them once we know about them. So you've got to go ahead and proactively find bugs to begin with. Embedded devices, because this is a big thrust for a lot of people, you know, usually it's firmware, and firmware is like a lot harder to change, as I'm pretty sure you're all aware. But, you know, I mean, it's like basic components with like very, very simple functionality, but unless you're going to go ahead, odds are pretty good in most environments that this firmware will never go ahead and be updated. At least that's been my experience in even the most critical environments. So what you want to do is, again, fuzzing is another fundamental way of saying, if our software is going to be in production for years to come and never be upgraded, we better make damn sure that the, so that the security, that we're doing everything we can to make sure no bugs exist. And again, it's not even just the bu well, no bugs and then no security vulnerabilities exist. Um, generally, the developers aren't in, in, well, you guys are kind of, if you're developers, you're kind of screwed. Because what happens is, you really can't force the users to fix the problems. You've got to find the problems in advance or else, you know, you're not going to be able to go ahead and do anything good. You're going to look like crap because of something that's completely out of your control. So you really should be testing most of the time as best you can. And again, this is kind of one of the justifications for doing something like fuzzing proactively where you can test software infinitely quicker than doing it manually. Uh, again, it can prevent the software vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, if you show your payback, generally what you'll find is that if you find it in the development process where fuzzing is supposed to be used, like I mentioned before, it'll save a thousand times the cost. In some cases, it's too late and it'll cost you your reputation. And you want to make sure you fix it before your reputation gets ruined. How many people remember Cold Fusion? I mean, yeah, that's like the security horror story of like the last decade. I mean, Cold Fusion was almost like hack at will. You know, I mean, literally, you could sneeze on a server running Cold Fusion and you can like pretty much take it over. And so eventually what happened was you had large companies banning Cold Fusion who had bad security to begin with. It was kind of on the pathetic side. There was one company where I was doing an assessment of that they had 75% of all of their administrative users were administrator and yet they were banning cold fusion because it had bad security. You know, that took, I mean, for that to happen, cold fusion had to be on the really, really pathetic side. But that tells you how bad things can be. Again, going out there, make fuzzing value known. Make sure that your people know that it's not going to just save cost, it's going to save your reputation, and it really is a lot more effective and a lot more efficient than just about any other reliability cost that you really might have. Um, Anyway, great books for your reading summertime pleasure, and I'm done. Any questions?